Next, I'll take you outside my own morgue for an inside look at America's most shocking cases. A five-day-old infant found dead has everyone crying murder. There was a lot of blood on the face itself. There was no other doubt in my mind that the baby had been killed. But it's the autopsy that cracks the case wide open. A five-day-old baby does not deserve this. And then, a medical examiner is floored when he discovers what killed a famous writer. Certainly nobody suspected what turned out to be the, the ultimate cause. As a mother and a forensic pathologist, some of the hardest investigations for me are the homicides that involve children. And in this next case, it's a five-day-old infant that dies under suspicious circumstances. And not surprisingly, it's the autopsy that holds the key to everything. Nineteen-year-old Amber Taylor has just given birth to a beautiful baby girl. But what should be the happiest time in her life will soon become her worst nightmare. It's 4.30 a.m., and Amber is wide awake, stricken with panic. Her five-day-old infant, Tamara, lying inches away in the same bed, is unresponsive. She wasn't breathing, and it was just like a shock. I didn't know exactly what to do, you know, like scream or what. Amber frantically calls 911. Paramedics arrive within minutes and attempt to revive the newborn. But it's too late. Five-day-old Tamara Taylor is dead. My world ended. It was like the knife through the heart. Detective Terry Fuller soon arrives at the trailer home and is immediately disturbed by its filthy condition. Dishes piled up, cobwebs, and clutter. But it's the sight of the baby that stops him dead in his tracks. The baby was laying in bed on the pillow, on his back, face up, and there was a lot of blood on the face itself. The nose, uh, eyes, eyelids, uh, around the forehead, blood pulled in, in, in the eye. As soon as I saw the baby, the, there, was, there was no other doubt in my mind that the baby had been killed. I've been in law enforcement for 17 years, but to see the baby in that condition, you get angry, <laughs> wondering how anybody could have done this to a five-day-old baby. Detective Fuller also has a strong suspicion about who could have killed her. It was the mother. She was the one that was sleeping with her. She was the one that was in bed with her all night. Nobody else was there. And the type of injuries I saw at that time all were in a pattern of somebody's fingernails being put over the baby with, with it being here, here, here. So there was no other doubt in my mind. She was my suspect. And his suspicion only deepens when he sits down to talk to her. So I go in the living room and confront the mother and notice she's got fingernails. And there's another disturbing trait. Surprisingly, the mother is just as passive as she can be. That confused me because I've interviewed a lot of people and uh, there was something wrong. But a strong hunch is not enough to arrest Amber for murder. We're gonna have to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that she intentionally and willingly killed that baby. Crime scene investigators photograph the scene and scour the home for any potential evidence. I uh, told him immediately, go ahead and start taking pictures. Take as many pictures as you can. Take pictures of the baby, of the bed, of the room inside the whole house. Take pictures of the outside of the house, the whole surroundings, and, and definitely get good photographs of the child. 
Detective Fuller then brings Amber down to the station for questioning. So I said, the baby has injuries on his face. And I said, those injuries had to get there somehow. And I asked her, okay, in your opinion, what do you think happened to the baby? And she has no idea. The only thing Amber remembers is that the baby seemed a bit congested. She also recalls taking a prescribed painkiller right before bed to ease the lingering pain from delivery. I always make sure she would sleep before I would go to sleep because I know as soon as I take the pill, I was out. The next thing she remembers is waking to find Tamara dead beside her. So she said she didn't hear the baby breathing. She rolled over and found the baby in the condition that it was in. I had to keep telling him, I didn't do that, I didn't do that. It was like a broken record, I just felt like I had to keep saying it, saying it, and saying it. They were just grilling me, grilling, 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 and I don't even know what was going on, but I felt like I had did something wrong. You know, she adamantly said, you know, I, I didn't have anything to do with it. But Detective Fuller isn't buying it. I told her, it's pretty cut and dry. I've been doing this a long time. And I've seen a lot of crime scenes, and I've seen a lot of wounds and whatnot. And these wounds are, are definitely consistent with your fingernails. So I told her, okay, well, you're, I'm going to take your fingernails. And we're going to have them check for blood or tissue. Detective Fuller photographs and clips her fingernails, then sends them to the lab, confident that the forensics investigator will find evidence linking Amber to her daughter's death. In my mind, the fingernails were going to get to forensics. They were going to call me back and say, get a warrant. But it will take four days to get the lab results. Until then, he has no choice but to let her go. That evening at home, Amber watches the local news with horror. One of the news stations came on TV and they were like, 19-year-old mother accused of murder. Then it said, blunt force trauma to the head. At this point, instead of just the police against you, it's everybody. And that includes members of her immediate family. My own father went to my job and when I go in, they were like, oh, your, your dad just left. And he asked us, why did you kill your baby? I mean, you, you always know of innocent until proven guilty, but at this rate, it was like I was guilty, guilty, guilty. Amber is suspected of foul play, and until we have the answer, she's always going to be under suspicion. But you may not be able to tell foul play occurred until you do that autopsy. While the lab is processing Amber's fingernail swabs, Tamara's tiny body arrives at the Bailey County morgue. Dr. Joseph Prollo is the forensic pathologist entrusted to answer the pressing question on everyone's mind. Did Amber kill her baby? We don't want to ever miss a homicide because that would prevent justice from being served. With utmost delicacy, Dr. Prollo starts unzipping the tiny body bag. The next thing I did was then to examine the injuries on this baby very closely. The most striking feature was that there was a decent amount of dried blood on the baby's face. I next washed the dried blood away from the wounds, and I was able to actually get a really good view of the injuries that we were dealing with. The police were concerned that the, the mother's fingernails may have produced these injuries. I was convinced that it was her fingernails. There was nothing else that could have made the, the injuries. I told him I needed to know something as soon as he could you know, get it to me. But as Dr. Prollo scrutinizes the baby's wounds, he makes an unexpected discovery. 
many of them had uh, kind of a V-shaped pattern or a W or M-shaped pattern to them. It's a pattern that Dr. Prowlow recognizes from previous autopsies. It was at that moment that I realized that the wounds on the face were not caused by fingernails. In fact, he now believes that the bloody injuries were inflicted by something far more disturbing. When I realized this, I then kind of had to step back and think about it, and I called the police. Dr. Joseph Prolo has just made a surprising discovery in the death of five-day-old Tamara Taylor. The lacerations on the infant's face were not caused by the mother's fingernails. These were absolutely, without a doubt, caused by a rat biting the body. It is so hideous to think that rats attack this baby. I've never had a case personally where the baby was killed by the rat, but I know it occurs. It's in the literature. There are cases of this. They have very sharp incisors. They actually can cut the skin. They can puncture uh, vessels. And they can cause enough blood loss through their bites to truly kill an infant. Detective Fuller is completely floored by the news. This child was bitten numerous times by this rat. Horrible bites. Not just nicks, they were horrible bites. You really get angry that the baby went through this much pain. A five day old baby does not deserve this. And the horror of these specific injuries raises a whole new suspicion criminal neglect. Why didn't she wake up? If she had nothing to do with it, why didn't she wake up when the baby was crying? I mean, did the mom go out that night and leave the baby alone. Detective Fuller immediately heads to Amber's house for another round of questioning. But when he tells her what happened, she's in total shock. To hear that your baby had bite marks, to have a baby be tortured like that, it, it just killed me. Amber blames her inability to respond on the pain medication she was taking. I basically hated myself because I thought maybe if I could wake up out of this sleep that I was in for taking this medicine that I could have stopped it. Back at the morgue, Dr. Prolo must now answer some key questions. Did the rat kill Tamara? And if so, exactly how did she die? His findings will be critical to determining whether Amber will be charged with criminal neglect. As a first step, Dr. Prolo must consider the evidence he's gathered in the external autopsy thus far. When we see blood associated with a wound, it means more often than not that that wound was bleeding. And wounds only bleed when a person is still alive. So in this case, the blood led me to think that they were antemortem wounds. And that's just a fancy way of saying that they occurred prior to death. It was disturbing thinking that these may have been inflicted during the life of this infant. Rat bites could kill the infant in a relatively quick fashion, and that, that would almost have to involve the baby bleeding to death from these injuries. So I needed to know how much blood did this infant lose? But to find out, Dr. Prolo must look for clues outside the body. The clothing, I think maybe a blanket, came with the body, and there was blood on those items. We then asked for the 
the additional bedding that had not come in. So there was a pillow involved, a sheet on a bed. Next, he contacts the crime lab and asks them to measure the amount of blood that has soaked into these items. The medical examiner's office is in the same building as the crime lab. So there's a very good working relationship between the forensic pathologists and the crime lab personnel. And it was uh, very common for us to call the crime lab folks down to take a look at a case or to take things straight up from the morgue to the crime lab. Their analysis yields a surprising result. They were able to determine an estimate of about four cc's, four milliliters of blood uh, that had soaked into the clothing and bedding that was there. So it was not a whole lot of blood that was lost. In fact, the blood loss is so minute that Dr. Prollo now questions whether the rat bites could have killed her at all. To be absolutely sure, he must turn his attention once again to the newborn's wounds. And it isn't long before Dr. Prollo recognizes a pattern that wasn't obvious when he first examined them. It became readily apparent to me that the reason these rodent bites looked like antemortem injury was because the majority of those bite marks on the infant's face were on the right side. So with the baby on her back and her head turned to the right, the blood will begin to settle on the right side of her face based on gravity. So if injuries are made even after death, they can have the appearance of antemortem injury. A phenomenon called lividity caused the post-mortem wounds to appear as if they were bleeding. When death occurs, uh, the heart stops and the blood stops circulating. And what will happen within a couple of hours in the dead body is that the blood will begin to pool and it will, it will settle based on gravity. And we call that liver mortis or lividity. So the fact that lividity is forming in this area will make those tissues very, very blood filled, if you will. So if injuries are made even after death, they can have the appearance of antemortem injuries. For Dr. Prollo, one thing is now clear. The rat could not have killed Tamara because the newborn was already dead when it attacked her. A detective Fuller has a theory as to why. Possibly some milk residue still in the mouth. And possibly this rat walking around the bed, walking around the baby, smelt the milk, and that's what caused the rat to bite the baby. Though disturbing, the finding does provide a small comfort. Finding that the baby was already deceased at the time of the rat attack eases a lot of pain and anger. It's a relief that the baby didn't go through any pain. And suddenly, Amber's entire story is seeming a lot more credible. It clearly explains why the mother wasn't awakened by any cries or screams. But what it doesn't explain is how Tamara died. Now back at square one, Dr. Prallo wonders if he'll ever find an answer. A vast majority of the infant autopsies that we perform, the cause of death remains to an extent a mystery. In most instances, the babies are dying from something that we call sudden infant death syndrome. Sudden Infant Death Syndrome, or SIDS, is a conclusion that all medical examiners hope to avoid. SIDS is a totally unsatisfactory diagnosis because it's basically saying we don't know why the child died. We have done exhaustive testing 
we've done an exhaustive scene investigation, we've done a complete autopsy, we've looked at the tissues, we've done microscopic examination, and after all that is done, we still have a dead infant with no good answer. So Dr. Prollo will now be on the hunt for anything and everything. In a baby this age, I will be concerned about congenital problems, some underlying natural disease, uh, infectious disease, or something that's traumatic. He starts his search with the infant's head. But to do so, he must open the skull. A newborn skull is comprised of four plates, which are not entirely flush, leaving an opening on the top of the baby's head called a soft spot, or fontanelle. Rather than cut through the skull, Dr. Prollo uses a special technique called pedaling, in which each plate is pried open to reveal the organ below. With the brain finally exposed, Dr. Prollo scrutinizes it for any abnormality or possible trauma. There was essentially no injury internally. There were no skull fractures, there were no facial bone fractures, there was no bleeding around the brain, there was no brain injury whatsoever. Next, he examines the baby's internal organs. There were no injuries of the internal organs. Everything looked essentially normal. That is, until he gets to the lungs. They should appear light pink with a spongy texture when healthy. The lungs had a firm consistency. They were discolored a little more dark than normal. Something was going on in the lungs, but I couldn't say for sure. When you do an autopsy on infants, you know, they have these the tiny uh, lungs, and it's difficult with your naked eye to really tell what's going on. To really determine the cause, you have to look under the microscope. It's essential for an infant autopsy. Dr. Prollo carves tiny slivers of lung tissue and sends them to the lab for processing. When the samples finally return, he wastes no time slipping the first one under the magnification lens. Slowly, an image comes into focus. And in an instant, it spins the case in a whole new direction. You don't take everything at face value. Everything isn't necessarily what it seems to be. Yes, this is Dr. Prollo. Got it completely changed your thinking about the whole thing. I didn't know exactly what was going to happen. I just prayed. I know God will make a way, and I know he doesn't put too much on a person that they can't bear. As Dr. Prollo studies the microscopic slides of Tamara Taylor's lung tissue, he spots clear evidence of an infection. And with this discovery, he finally knows exactly what killed the five-day-old baby. What I am seeing under the microscope suggested to me that this is a herpes infection. Infections from herpes are very common. An estimated four out of five people carry a form of the virus. There are actually several different types of herpes viruses. Uh, there's herpes type 1, herpes type 2. Herpes type 1 is typically considered the virus that results in fever blisters. Herpes type 2 is considered a sexually transmitted disease. Uh, it typically occurs in the genitalia. A herpes infection for which there is no cure, can cause recurrent painful blisters around the genitals or mouth. It's also contagious, generally spread through skin-to-skin -skin contact. But in infants, the infection almost always comes from the mother. I believe what happened was that during passage through the birth canal, this baby was infected with the herpes virus from her mother. Babies can be infected with the herpes virus in a variety of different ways. 
the baby can actually be infected in utero and have all sorts of congenital problems related to fetal infection of herpes. There are different manifestations of what we call neonatal herpes infection. It can be limited to the central nervous system, the brain. It can be just limited to the skin where babies will have herpes blisters just on the skin. It can be what we call a disseminated infection where the herpes virus just goes throughout the body. This form of the virus is called neonatal herpes because it infects neonates, babies within the first month of life. They don't have a very good immune system at that age. For an adult who has a active immune system, herpes is not a big deal. It doesn't affect us the way it affects neonates, but almost universally with babies, they have a hard time fighting off that herpes virus. And 40% of them still die with treatment. From the moment she was born, Tamara Taylor faced daunting odds. The herpes virus infected the lungs and started reproducing in the lungs, essentially taking over the lungs. During that time, the baby experienced increasing difficulties with breathing and then ultimately succumbed to the overwhelming infection of the herpes virus in her lungs. This baby died of herpes pneumonia. Dr. Prallo's findings now completely clear Amber of any wrongdoing once and for all. And when he calls Detective Fuller with the news, the seasoned investigator is taken by surprise. I mean, she was telling me the truth the whole time. I didn't believe her at all. I mean, there was no way us being nervous that I was believing her. But she, she knew she was innocent. She clearly knew she did not have anything to do with this. Amber is relieved that Dr. Prallo has finally put a name to Tamara's killer. But she's shocked by the revelation that she contracted the herpes virus and then unknowingly passed it on to her newborn child. And then that made it even worse because then it's me, like the whole time. I want the doc. I go to the doctor regularly. So we had a full checkup, everything inside our blood test. And the only thing to come back is, um, is you're pregnant. It might be hard to believe that most people who have herpes are not aware of it. They either fail to recognize their symptoms or have no symptoms at all. The problem is when women first get infected, 75% of them are asymptomatic. And if they happen to be giving birth, that's gonna infect the baby. And so the vast majority of those 1,500 to 2,000 babies that are born each year with neonatal herpes, their mom had no idea that they had herpes. If a woman is known to have herpes, they will tend not to uh, have a vaginal birth. They'll go to cesarean section to avoid uh, neonatal herpes. Looking back now, Tamara's symptoms of congestion suddenly make complete sense. I would see her and she would just, like, she'd take a breath and it'd be like, and I, and I was like, what, you know, what is that? And I didn't actually know, so I was thinking, okay, since I was born with asthma, I'm thinking maybe she has it, so let me ask the doctors. But according to Amber, the hospital assured her that the newborn was fine. I kept asking them the same thing, and they still said it was normal for her to breathe like that. Whether or not a prompt diagnosis would have saved Tamara's life remains uncertain. But one thing is clear. The autopsy itself averted another potential tragedy. What's really scary about the whole thing is that years and years ago, before there was adequate forensics. Police department would have gone to a scene like this, found the baby in the condition it was in, and the story behind it, with the mother with fingernails, they would have locked her up right there. 
no, no ifs and or buts about it. If it wouldn't been from the doctor going the extra mile, she would have been tried and sent to prison. The only way to recover from something like that is to go day by day. I have two kids, and they're wonderful, and I see, it's like, I see her and them, and both of them, and they're old enough to know now, and I already explained to them what happened. They see her picture, they were like, Mom, we miss her, we wish she was still here. And I said, just know that you got an angel that's over you. And they were like, oh, Mom, we're sorry that you had to go through that. For Dr. Prollo, it's a constant reminder that every autopsy matters. We as forensic pathologists often will say it would be a really bad thing if we missed a homicide. But there's one thing worse than missing a homicide is to uh, have a wrong opinion about what's going on. And then as a result of that, Someone who's innocent is sent to prison. I can't imagine what it would be like to have to experience losing a child, not knowing why the child died, and everybody thinking you did something to it. But at least the autopsy gave Amber a chance to live the rest of her life without the shadow of suspicion. Sometimes, something seemingly inconsequential could lead directly to a person's death. And more often than not, these unlikely suspects would go undetected if it weren't for the autopsy. And that's exactly what happened in the tragic and strange case of famous author Sherwood Anderson. At age 64, Sherwood Anderson's life is in shambles. The famed writer believes that a trip to South America will reverse his fortunes and revive his floundering career. But a journey that begins with hope is about to come to a bizarre and tragic end. Famed writer Sherwood Anderson hasn't tasted success in years. Desperate to save his reputation as one of America's great literary figures, he and his wife, Eleanor, embark on a trip to South America. Anderson and his wife uh, board their ship, which is going to take them through the Panama Canal and eventually to the western coast of South America. He was looking for a fresh start, a whole new place. He, to him, America had, had soured. 20 years earlier, Sherwood Anderson was one of the most famous writers in the world. In 1919, at age 42, he wrote the American classic, Winesburg, Ohio. Something that we know now as the distinct 20th century American style comes directly from Anderson, in particular in his Winesburg, Ohio phase. Throughout the 1920s, he was the toast of the literary world, writing three bestsellers and influencing a generation of young authors. <laughs> But by 1941, his career has hit rock bottom. In the late 1930s, Anderson had seen a series of his novels roundly criticized. He saw himself clearly as an aging writer whose literary talent was diminished, reputation tarnished. He had been essentially turned on by so many of his former protégés. Hemingway was running around, essentially mocking him. This was one of the great tragedies of Sherwood Anderson's career. And his personal life is no less turbulent. After three failed marriages, Sherwood now struggles with his fourth wife, Eleanor. They seemed happy together, but Anderson was a man that never was quite happy where he was or what he was doing. He's an incredibly restless individual. 
he had a lot of things to be depressed about, and that was when he was drinking a lot and drinking heavily. He didn't look well. He was getting sort of flabby. He looked tired. And in 1940, Sherwood Anderson had suffered some flu and, uh, and cold symptoms. In fact, everything in Sherwood's life seems broken. And he's eager to escape it all when he learns of one place where his popularity is soaring. South America. He had begun meeting a number of writers from South America. And uh, they encouraged him to come to South America. We would love to host you. We would love to feature your visit. And so uh, he decided that he would do that. He wanted to find a new place he told people, I might stay for a few months, I might never come back. He was looking for a fresh start. But Sherwood's desperate journey to put the pieces of his life back together begins with an omen of impending doom. The day that he boarded the ship, Anderson had begun to complain of some stomach problems, some kind of pain that he was having. He had no idea that it was going to develop into something as severe as it would. Sherwood Anderson's trip to South America gets off to a shaky start. On his first day at sea, he suffers bouts of queasiness and abdominal pain. But on first blush, he assumes it's just the result of a simple hangover. On the evening prior to leaving for South America, Sherwood and Eleanor were invited for cocktails in Greenwich Village. And a lot of close friends were there to, to say goodbye to Sherwin on this occasion. On that final night in New York, Anderson was drinking his, his favorite drink, which was a martini with one olive. And he was consuming quite many of these drinks. The tally varies, but probably six martinis in a row. But the hard-drinking Anderson is no stranger to hangovers. And when the symptoms don't clear up by nightfall, his wife Eleanor offers up another theory. Food poisoning. Prior to the departure on the trip, they went to uh, an Italian restaurant and Eleanor got violently ill. I think it was something like food poisoning, probably. The couple also wonders if a bout of the flu that Anderson suffered in the weeks leading up to the trip could somehow be related. People with flu are more prone to developing other infections. In this case, if someone who had had the flu for several months came in with abdominal pain, I would probably start to think, first off, that this was some other infection. On the third day of the voyage, Eleanor finally convinces Anderson to see the ship's doctor. The doctor performs a thorough exam, but is baffled by the ongoing symptoms. Ultimately, he attempts to treat Anderson with an enema made from molasses and milk. Enemas are used in situations of constipation, and a wide variety of preparations have been used for thousands of years. Now, molasses and milk is interesting because sugar actually draws water into your intestine and will cause you to have a bowel movement. But regardless of what's behind the strange symptoms, one thing soon becomes clear. The 65-year-old's condition is growing more severe by the hour. Anderson was essentially bedridden. He was racked with this pretty severe intestinal pain. Spent most of his time in this cabin. In what may be the last thing he ever wrote in his diary, he said, the water is very choppy and everything in the stateroom is flying back and forth and so in this final diary entry we get the sense of things coming apart uh, just disintegrating by the fifth day of the trip 
Anderson's condition has deteriorated to a point where Eleanor now fears for her husband's life. She arranges for the ship's captain to radio ahead to have an ambulance meet them at the port in Crystal Ball to transport him directly to a hospital. On March 5th, 1941, Sherwood Anderson is carried off the ship and transported to Cologne Hospital in Panama. He's in some intense pain. They're giving him morphine at this point, which is doing nothing for him, apparently. I think the medical people at Cologne were mystified. Eleanor is helpless. All she can do is watch as her husband grows sicker and sicker. Anderson becomes delirious. He falls into a coma. His uh, pulse is racing. And within an hour, he's dead. He was pronounced dead at 5.40 p.m. on March 8, 1941. From stomach pains to death in just eight days, it's a tragic and baffling end for the once celebrated author. And Eleanor is now desperate for answers. They were in the dark as to, you know, the cause of death. Sherwood Anderson's body is transferred across the canal zone to the morgue at Gorgas Hospital. Now it's up to Dr. B. H. Keen to figure out what killed the writer. He begins by reviewing the medical history. Is it possible that food poisoning or Anderson's heavy drinking could have played a role? And what about the mysterious flu-like symptoms he suffered in the weeks prior to his demise? There are many things that could kill you in eight days. Could it be pancreatitis, an inflammation of the pancreas? Could it be some type of obstruction? Is, does he have a tumor that caused a bowel obstruction? Does he have a volvulus, the bowel turning on itself, causing it to not get blood? But despite a long list of potential culprits, Dr. Keene knows where to start. He cuts open the body and heads straight for the source of all the problems, the abdominal cavity. And it isn't long before he spots trouble. Dr. Keene, as soon as he opens the abdomen, he found peritonitis. That's an infection in your abdominal cavity. The majority of the abdominal cavity was covered in a film of yellowish green pus. Bacteria had somehow gotten out of his bowels and set up shop in his abdominal cavity and caused an infection. And that infection then got into his blood, it got into his entire body and caused his death. But the discovery of the deadly infection is just the beginning. And for Dr. B. H. Keene, things are about to get a lot more bizarre. You have this kind of strange twist, but not in the way that everybody thought. When Dr. Keene opens Sherwood's abdominal cavity, he immediately discovers the cause of death. A massive bacterial infection, peritonitis. Now it's time for Dr. Keene to figure out what caused this peritonitis. Why did the bacteria leak out of his bowels? Did he have a tumor that ruptured? Did something cause a hole? Or did the bowel just not have the integrity to hold the bacteria in? So now it's important for him to go through that bowel and figure out what was wrong that caused that bacteria to leak out. He begins his search for any abnormality in the abdominal organs starting with the gallbladder. When he looked at the gallbladder, it appeared smooth and totally normal, no signs of inflammation there. So at that point, he could really rule out perforation of the gallbladder. Next up, the pancreas. The pancreas also appeared completely normal. And he can find nothing wrong with the appendix or the small intestines either. Dr. Keene is starting to run out of possible culprits. The last organ on his list, the colon. So as Dr. Keene started his examination of the colon, he starts to see 
these outpouchings. And what he found was a particularly large amount of pus in that whole area. Amongst this pus, Dr. Keen finally hits pay dirt. A tiny hole in one of the out pockets of the colon. This is clearly what allowed bacteria to leak into the abdominal cavity, ultimately triggering a deadly infection. But Dr. Keen is astonished by what he finds next. As he's moving through the tissue, he's finally able to locate a, a, a small object, which he uh, is able to grasp and pull out intact a three-inch toothpick. A toothpick. It's a staggering find. But how on earth could a fully intact toothpick have made its way into Sherwood Anderson's colon? Mr. Anderson's unfortunate toothpick was inadvertently swallowed and made its way down his esophagus into his stomach. It then navigated a few meters of his small intestine it then managed to make its way down to the left side of his colon, where the toothpick eventually perforated the wall of the colon, probably only 25 or 30 centimeters from the anus, where it would have been expelled naturally. And this may seem really odd, but honestly, it's not that rare. Swallowing objects is a common problem, you know, foreign body ingestion. Most of the time it passes straight through and doesn't cause any problems. But about 1% of the time it can perforate, but your chances of it perforating is much higher if it's long and thin like a toothpick. But what I think is really unusual is that there are some studies that show only 12% of the time when they've swallowed a toothpick that they even remember swallowing it. They have no idea they've swallowed a toothpick. This is why my husband refuses to eat anything with a toothpick in it. Have you ever seen a club sandwich with a toothpick just getting lost in that sandwich? They can be dangerous. People swallow those toothpicks and they end up perforating your bowel. Dr. Keene can now close the autopsy file on one of the most unlikely deaths he has ever seen. You know, it's great about having a toothpick perforating the colon. There's no question what the cause of death is, what the mechanism of death is. You, you have the evidence, the toothpick going through the bowel. You see it with your own eyes. Those kind of cases are great. But Dr. Keene still has one last question. At the time that the autopsy is completed, he knows it's a toothpick, and he knows that it's the culprit in having caused this horrible condition, terrible pain, and ultimately Addison's death. We don't know where it came from, you say. What's actually really great about Dr. Keene is he kind of wondered, well, how in the world could he have swallowed a toothpick? And one of his fellow physicians actually suggested I bet he likes martinis. And so when Dr. Keene visits Eleanor Anderson immediately after the autopsy, he says, by the way, Mrs. Anderson, did your husband enjoy martinis? And she said, oh, yes. He liked them very dry and always with an olive. It seems most plausible that what must have happened is that on that final night in New York before he left on his voyage, he literally threw back a martini with an olive as was his favorite and seems to have ingested the olive and the three inch toothpick entirely whole. And so in the end, Sherwood's favorite drink ends up killing him. 
though in the most unlikely way imaginable. You have this kind of strange twist that it was related to his drinking, but not in the way that everybody thought. It was not so much the overindulgence of alcohol, rather just a simple swallowing of the toothpick. And the fatal result of this seemingly random act supports a theory that Sherwood himself details in one of his final writings, an essay entitled, Chance Rules Us All. Yes, interestingly enough, he wrote it just two or three weeks before he died. And he said it was sometimes just a, a, a seemingly insignificant uh, happening that can have a real shaping transformative effect on life thereafter. Because uh, fate rules us all. I think it's clear that alcohol played a major role in Sherwood Anderson's death. If he wasn't drinking so heavily, he probably wouldn't have swallowed that toothpick in the first place and died when he did. If there's a lesson to be learned from this case, it's never take anything for granted, no matter how large or small.